Okay, so our second day of 5.5, our last day of really getting into the nitty gritty of all the properties of quadrilaterals. Uh, so we're not really gonna learn anything new today. We're just gonna uh, practice how we can take all that massive amount of information that you've learned over the last couple of days, apply it, and have better ways of remembering it, right? So yesterday at the beginning of the lesson, um, you guys saw the quadrilateral family tree, which I find extremely helpful. That one is one that sticks in my brain. Um, but there is another way to graphically represent that idea of how all these quadrilaterals um, kind of overlap and line up and all of that. And that is with a Venn diagram. So um, I'm sure you've seen Venn diagrams before, uh, but this is one of those places where it does actually help. So it depends on what type of visual representation you like and, you know, that really sticks with you. This is a different one. So pause your video, draw it. It's not a real easy Venn diagram to draw um, if you need to, but this is just a another way to kind of visually remember how all these things fit together. So remember with a Venn diagram, right, if <clears throat> an entire circle is inside of another circle, like the rectangle circle is completely inside the parallelogram circle, that means that all rectangles are parallelograms, right? They're just more specific. Um, if you have um, a circle that overlaps, but isn't completely inside like this green one here, right? That means that some of them fall into that category, but some don't. And that's this like kite circle, right? The kites that are not inside the parallelogram bubble are just kites. The kites that are in the parallel, par parallelogram bubble, but not in rectangle, those are just the rhombuses, rhombi. Uh, but then the kites that are inside rectangle and parallelogram, those are our squares, right? Because it's a kite, it's a rhombus, and it's a rectangle, that makes it a square. So that's kind of how those bubbles work for Venn diagrams, just a quick review. So these actually come into play very well, again, for your true, false, always, sometimes, nevers, those kind of ideas, right? So if you can draw that picture, then um, you can really remember where everything falls, and these true, false things come very easily. So the first true, false says a rhombus has all the properties of a rectangle. Okay, let's find the rhombus a rhombus here and a rectangle here. Does a rhombus have all the properties of a rectangle? Like, is a rhombus a rectangle? The answer is no, they're not overlapping. There's one tiny little slice that's overlapping, but those are the squares, right? A plain old rhombus does not have the properties of a rectangle. This is false. Okay, the next one says, a kite has all the properties of a parallelogram. Here's a kite. Here's a parallelogram, right? Remember, the kites are the part of that bubble that are outside of the parallelogram bubble. So the answer is no, they don't share the same properties, right? So number two is also false. Number three says a rectangle has all the properties of a parallelogram. So here's rectangle, here's the bubble, completely inside the parallelogram bubble, right? So for number three, the answer is true. All rectangles have every property of a parallelogram. So this one is true. And now maybe you could answer that without using the Venn diagram, but I just wanted to show you a way that you could use that um, in order to help answer those true false that sometimes get a little bit tricky and kind of all the words jumble up in your head. So Venn diagram is another great representation. So let's talk about, you know, well, here's the, a whole bunch more, right? These were all the properties ones, but you can just use that Venn diagram. You can use your family tree. Um, you know, yesterday we talked about how to use that family tree for these true false ideas, right? The always, sometimes, nevers. But I'm gonna just keep referring back to um, the Venn diagram up here is to answer that. So it says trapezoids are parallelograms for number one. Here's trapezoid. Here's parallelogram. Those bubbles do not overlap. The answer to that is false. Okay, number two, a rectangle is a rhombus. Now, whenever you need to, if you wanna pause your video, write it down, see if you can answer it, and then come back and see it. I think that's a great way to do these. A rectangle is a rhombus for number two. Let's see, here's a rectangle. Here's a rhombus. Is a rectangle ever a rhombus? Well, it is sometimes, right? If this was an always, sometimes, never, this would be a sometimes, but this is just a true false. Is a rectangle a rhombus? False. Unless it's always, always, it has to be false. Okay. 
Number three, squares are rectangles. Is a square a rectangle? Square completely inside the rectangle bubble. Yes, that one is true. All squares are rectangles, true. Parallelograms are quadrilaterals. Parallelogram completely inside that giant quadrilateral bubble, right? True. Isosceles trapezoids are parallelograms. Here's isosceles trapezoid. Here's parallelogram. Those bubbles do not overlap, so the answer to that is false. Oops. All right. Rhombus is a square. Rhombuses are squares. Let's see. Here's a rhombus. This is a square, right? Is every rhombus a square? No. Some rhombi are squares, but not all of them, so the answer is false. A rhombus is not always a square. Ooh, but now the backwards, right, is a square, a rhombus. So here's square, here's the rhombus circle. True. Every square is a rhombus. It is inside that rhombus circle. So this one is true. A trapezoid is a rectangle. Trapezoid, rectangle, don't overlap, definitely false. Okay. A rectangle is a parallelogram. Rectangles are parallelograms. Here's rectangle. This whole rectangle bubble is completely inside the parallelogram bubble. That one is true. All right, rectangles are parallelograms, true. And our last one here, a rhombus is a parallelogram. Rhombuses are parallelograms. Here's our rhombus. Here's our parallelogram bubble. Yes, every rhombus is a parallelogram. It's completely inside that parallelogram bubble. True. So it does get a little confusing with the overlapping parts, but when you can see like a whole bubble inside the other one, the true false gets really easy. Or if there's a whole bubble outside the other one. So the Venn diagram, you know, helps for those real straightforward ones. I think the family tree does a little bit better job on those overlapping ones, right? It's easier to kind of manage your way through that. But I just wanted to show you another method in case that family tree wasn't connecting with you. So let's talk about, okay, how can we use all of these properties, right? So let's get some problems here where we're given some information uh, and we really want to just see how we use all those, um, all that massive list of details. So first of all here we have VRZA is a parallelogram. So we know all of the things that go along with a parallelogram. What do I know? Let's see, opposite sides are congruent and opposite sides are parallel. But looking at all of my given information here, it's looking like they're just giving me segment lengths and no angle measures. So I don't think the parallel is going to come into play. But I do know, since it's a parallelogram, both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. That's how we use that information, right? Now let's put all these different things where they go. So segment AV is 2x minus 4. All right, segment VR is 3Y plus 5. Segment RZ, there's a weird line here, ignore that, right? RZ is 1 half X plus 8. And then I have segment ZA, which is Y plus 12. It's asking me to find the perimeter, right? So if I want to find the perimeter, I need to figure out what are x and y. I need to find out all those side lengths, and then I need to put all the pieces together. Well, since I know that the opposite sides are congruent, that means that I have two different pairs, uh, or two different equations that I could write, right? So the first one, I would say these two sides are congruent. So I could say 2x minus 4 equals 1 half x plus 8. The other equation that I could write is that the top and the bottom are congruent, right? So I could say 3y plus 5 
equals y plus 12. Now I notice in my two equations, like in the first equation, I only have x's. In my second equation, I only have y's. Well, that's cool, so I can just solve each one separately. Hopefully you can pause your video and solve away without listening. But if you get stuck, here we go. So in my first equation over on the left, I see that I have a fraction. I am going to clear that fraction immediately. Remember, to clear fractions, we multiply by the denominator. So 2x times 2 is 4x minus 8 equals x plus 16. So I cleared that 1 half just to make my life easier. Subtract x. So I get 3x minus 8 equals 16. 8 to both sides, I get 3x equals 24. So then when I solve, I get x equals 8. All right, so I could take that x equals 8 and plug it back into my picture up here. So that means that I have 2 times 8 minus 4. 2 times 8 is 16. So I have 16 minus 4, which gives me 12. Okay, then I could do the same thing over here on the right hand side. So 1 half times 8 plus 8. Plugging in my 8 here for x. So I get 4 plus 8. Oh, look, it happens to be 12. Boy, I didn't even have to show the work on that one. I knew my opposite sides were going to be congruent, right? But depending on which side you started with, you could do either one, but you didn't have to do both. Okay, now I'm going to hop in here into the middle and I'm going to solve this one. So let's see, over here, I'm gonna subtract y. I get 2y plus 5 equals 12. I'm going to subtract 5. I get 2y equals 7. I'm gonna divide by 2. I get y equals 7 halves. Now I know that you guys are gonna all do this and you're just gonna write 3.5. Okay, fine, whatever, it's up to you, okay. So let's see, if I plug that back in, so I have 3.5 plus 12 up here on the top, which is gonna be 15.5, or 15 and a half if you wanna make me and Mr. Morris happy without the decimals, but we know you, this is an okay decimal, I guess. If you plugged into the bottom first, it'd be three times 3.5 plus five, whoops. 3 times 3.5 is 10.5 plus 5, which gives us again 15.5. All right, so the problem did ask us for the perimeter, right? So the perimeter means I would have to add all of those up. So I'd have 2 12s plus 2 15.5s. So for the perimeter, there we go, I would have... 24 plus 31. So the perimeter would be 55. So that's how you could use that idea. Like, okay, all I know is it's a parallelogram, but I know so much because I know it's a parallelogram, right? So that would be a way you would use it in an algebra problem. Like what properties could you use in that picture that would help you write your equations? All right, but more often, again, we're gonna use it in some proofs, right? So in this picture, you're probably going to have to pause and draw and set up your givens and all that good stuff. But B-R-O-W, oh, sorry, that one got cut off. So this is a W over here. B-R-O-W is an isosceles trapezoid. So step one, B-R-O-W is an isosceles trapezoid. And again, go ahead and pause and see if you can do this on your own. That would be great, right? It says that segment BR is parallel to WO. So we knew that we had one pair of opposite sides. Whoops, sorry. Um, parallel. This given is telling us which one it is. So we probably could have guessed, but this is confirming, right? We don't ever want to guess when we are writing a proof. So my goal is to prove that triangle WON is an isosceles triangle. So I'm trying to prove that that triangle is isosceles, right? 
So I'm guessing that I'm going to want to try to prove that these two sides are congruent. All right. Hmm. Well, let's see. If I know that this is an isosceles trapezoid, if I know it's an isosceles trapezoid, that means that the legs are congruent, right? So the non-parallel sides are congruent. So that means that segment BW would be congruent to segment RO. And the reason we'd put there it would be if a quadrilateral is an isosceles, whoops, sorry, trapezoid, then the legs are congruent. So that's how we're going to take those properties and write them in if-then form. If a quadrilateral is a blank, then what property are you using? The legs are congruent. Okay, so I know that for sure. Hmm. Well, let's see. If I'm working backwards a little bit, I need to get those two sides congruent, but I don't know if I'm going to. In isosceles trapezoid, my diagonals do not bisect each other, right? My diagonals are congruent, but they don't bisect, so I don't know that they're split in half. So I will know, I will know that the diagonals are, the whole things are congruent, but I won't know that they're bisected. Oh, I do think that that might help, though. If I say step four, segment BO is congruent to segment RW if a quad is an isosceles trapezoid, then the diagonals are congruent. I don't think, so I don't know they're bisected, so I can't use division property or anything like that to get to those two uh, angles, but I'm starting to picture, because if I want to get those two sides of my isosceles trapezoid, if I get these two angles congruent down here, if I get those angles congruent, I can use angles imply sides, right? So I can do that one way back from chapter three, whenever I have my isosceles triangles, that's what I'm looking for, right? Angles imply sides, sides imply angles. Which means if I can prove that this triangle, oh, sorry, let me uh, lighten it up here. If I can prove this triangle, BWO, is congruent to this triangle here, then those contain those little angles and I'm good to go, right? All right, if you need to redraw so you can see them a little bit better, this is what I'm talking about, R-O-W. Right now, I have these ones, and then over here, triangle B-W-O, these and I have the reflexive property right you see down at the bottom it's double highlighted there so I could do step 5 WO is congruent to WO and the reason is the reflexive property for right down here now I have my two triangles are congruent. So I can say triangle BWO is congruent to triangle ROW using side, side, side. And that was steps three, four, and five. Now, if you paused and did this on your own, and instead of saying that the diagonals were congruent, you said that the lower base angles were congruent and used side angle side, that would be perfectly fine as well. So just in your step four, or you know, you could have swapped out my step four for lower base angles congruent and gotten side angle side, and that is an acceptable way to do this proof. Uh, we're not done yet though. I just got my overlapping triangles congruent. Now I need the step that says, those two little angles, angle NWO is congruent to angle NOW. These guys right here, right? Those are the ones I wanted. That's CPCTC. And then my final step, oh, not my final step, I apologize. 
side NW is congruent to side NO, right? Angles imply sides. Or if sides are congruent, excuse me, if angles are congruent, then the sides are congruent. If two angles of a triangle are congruent, then the sides opposite them are congruent. However you want to write that, I like to use the symbols. And now our final step is saying that triangle WON is isosceles. And that's back from chapter 3. We learned this. If a triangle has two congruent sides, then it is isosceles. So you can see we used the idea that it was an isosceles trapezoid to get the properties, right? What do we know about an isosceles trapezoid um, that we can use then in our proof, right? So in our, again, our if-then form is if a quad is a blank, then whichever property you want, right? Um, step two, we had those parallel sides. It didn't seem like we used it, but we did because we needed to know which sides were the parallel sides to know which sides were the legs for our isosceles trapezoid. So we didn't use it for any actual angles in this one, and that's okay. You don't always have to. All right, so you're getting the idea. So here's another proof with a parallelogram, and we use parallelograms all the time. So let's just see. Maybe you want to pause on this one, see if you can take a chance at this one and uh, figure this one out. So our first one is that this is a parallelogram, right? A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. Now we are going to start using um, these things in proofs a whole heck of a lot. So again, I'm not sure if I've said it before, but in case not, if we want to say that we have a parallelogram, we can use a symbol for parallelogram. And that is a little parallelogram, right? But this is the only symbol, the only quadrilateral symbol we have. You cannot use a symbol for rectangle. You cannot use a symbol for square because they will all look the same. And I can't tell what's what when trying to decipher your little words. Parallelogram gets used so much, so much that uh, we that's why we use a symbol for it. So parallelogram is the only one that you can use a symbol for. All right, now that's the only thing given that I have. And I am going to try to prove that AC and BD, whoops, bisect each other. That means that I need to prove that AC is bisected, so this is congruent to this, and I need to prove that BD is bisected, so that means this is congruent to this, right? So I mean to those both pairs of congruent parts. Now, as I mark that, I am hoping that you're seeing, ooh, if I prove these two triangles are congruent, I could get CPCTC for both of them, and hopefully the triangles that you are seeing are this triangle, and I need a different color. This triangle, right? Now, how am I going to get that when I know that I have a parallelogram? Hmm. So I think we're going to, now I know that the diagonals bisect each other in a parallelogram. But the idea of this one is that I'm going to prove why. So I'm not just going to use that as a reason. Now we could, but I want to we want to show you that all of these properties that we've learned over the last couple of days, you could go through a proof and prove it, okay? So <clears throat> if I know that I have a parallelogram, that means that I know that my opposite sides are parallel, right? So I could say step two, AD, segment AD, is parallel to segment BC. If a quad is a parallelogram, then opposite sides are parallel. So I know that these are parallel, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. I also know that AD is congruent to BC. 
if a quad is a parallelogram, then opposite sides are congruent. So I've got a pair of congruent sides in those triangles that I'm trying to prove congruent, right? Now, as I highlighted my parallel sides, if you picture, what if I called this a transversal? If that was a transversal, then angle three would be congruent to angle four, right? Because those would be alternate interior angles. So angle three is congruent to angle four. If two lines are parallel, then alternate interior angles are congruent. Now the same thing could work if I still have my same parallel lines, but this time I think of this as my transversal, right? Now I have angle two is congruent to angle one. Same reason, those are my alternate interior angles now. Step five, angle one is congruent to angle two, same as four. Now, once I did that, you'll see I have angle side angle for my two triangles that I was trying to prove congruent. So I have triangle AED is congruent to triangle careful. A was the blue mark first and then the side and then the purple. So blue mark first is C, B, E. Got to get those lined up correctly. All right, and this was angle side angle. Steps three, four, and five. So now I have CPCTC for the first pair of parts, right? Segment AE is congruent to segment EC. AE, and well here, let's do these. And EC, right? That was CPCTC. And then I have my second, right, BE and ED. Those are congruent using CPCTC as well. And so then my last and final step, I can say that AC and BD bisect each other. Now we could put that in two steps, but since they did it all in one in the proof statement, that's fine. If a segment is split into two congruent parts, then it is bisected. So I, again, this proof, you know, obviously could have been like a two-step proof because the diagonals bisecting each other is a property of a parallelogram. But I wanted to show you more practice on how do you use the idea of those properties in a proof. How do you write those if-thens? But also I wanted to show you that every one of those properties that we wrote down yesterday, you could write a proof for going back to the basic information of each type of shape that we learned in 5.4, right? So if you just go to the essential idea of what that shape is, you can prove every single one of the properties that we wrote down yesterday. So they're all legit, okay? But we're not gonna make you do that, thank goodness. That would be way too many proofs and way too much writing. So this was just a way to do that. But now if you had that, um, the same thing and you were asked to do it on your homework, it's a two-step proof, right? Um, a, B, C, D is a parallelogram given next step, they bisect each other. If a quad is a parallelogram, then the diagonals bisect each other and that's perfectly fine. Okay, so today again, we're gonna take all those properties and we're gonna uh, apply them and, and see how we can use them. But we also had that Venn diagram to help us out if the family tree wasn't working for you yesterday.